Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the roundtable discussion on age, gender, disability, and diversity inclusion in the Global Protection Forum. My name is Sabrine, and I'm the facilitator for this session. The theme of this year's forum is in the hour of need, advancing prevention and proactive protection. This theme reflects the urgent need to protect the most vulnerable communities in a humanitarian crisis, especially those uh, who face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination and exclusion based on their age, gender, disability, or diversity. In this session, we will explore how to ensure um, inclusive and effective protection services for people with diverse needs. Uh, and identities in a humanitarian context. We will hear from five panelists who will share their experience, challenges, and best practices in applying an age, gender, and diversity approach in their work. We will also discuss how to address the gaps and opportunities in policy and the practice to promote the rights and dignity of all individuals. The session will last for 90 minutes. We will have 10 minutes for each panelist's presentation followed by 25 minutes for questions and answers from the audience, and 10 minutes for final closing re um, recommendations from Sabah, an inclusion colleague from Syria. We encourage you to participate actively in the session by asking questions, sharing your view, and providing feedback. You can use the chat function to raise your hand to indicate your interest. The session will be conducted in English, but we will provide interpretation services in Arabic and French for your convenience. Before we start, I would like to remind you of some ground rules for this session. Please respect the diversity of opinions and experience of the speakers and participants. Please use the respectful language and avoid any personal attacks or offense remarks. Please mute your microphone when you are not speaking and turn on your camera if possible. Please also respect the time uh, limit for your intervention and the questions. Um, so uh, now I would like to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, cooperation. I hope you will enjoy this session and learn from each other. Let me introduce our first panelist, Amjad, as a protection officer from protection sector in Syria to open the session. Amjad, how you see inclusion within a humanitarian context? Which experience that you would like to share from Syria? Uh, good afternoon, all. Can you hear me, Sabrine? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, first of all, Maybe I can quickly mention some, something about like AGD, age, gender, and diversity, uh, mainly about the, how essential is it and the equality and the importance of uh, gender analysis. Then maybe I can share with the participants something about the disability, how uh, a, a quick introduction and highlight on some terms, important terms, and then finally, we'll just be, be focused about the serious situation, what is going on and how is the protection sector response over there. Uh, we'll speak about the AGD, the age, gender, and diversity. I would say like uh, it is an essential for humanitarian actors to ensure that everyone in affected communities, AGD, is an appro is an uh, is not an option. It is a key component of fair and equal protection. Uh, I can also mention th something about uh, uh, equality, which is respect of diversity as a valuable element, and how uh, people uh, giving equal opportunities for people from different needs. I can also mention something about uh, in emergency response, older people are typically over, uh, overlooked. Sometimes they are rarely con uh, consulted with the needs. They are missed out uh, when there is a data collection, when there is data information. I would say in some operation, in some places, they are really, really uh, overlooked. 
I can also mention something about uh, how to to speak about the gender analysis when there is a strong analysis and there is integrating gender equality that helps all the humanitarian actors uh, to ensure accountability. Uh, then I can also mention something about the disability in general and how there is a need to improve the extent to which affected people, including people with disabilities, especially women and vulnerable groups. Uh, they also, I would like to highlight something about uh, who is responsible for this. It is a responsibility for all of us, humanitarians, donors, coordinators, implementing partners, and even government. I would like to stress on this. And also, I would like to, to mention uh, some, I uh, highlight some uh, uh, definitions and some terms, which is a disability inclusion. What does it mean? Mainstreaming inclusion and accessibility. Disability inclusion, which is a meaningful uh, participation of persons with disabilities in all their diversity. Mainstreaming inclusion is uh, a concept of a systemic approach to inclusion in all areas of operation and programming, which means also protection programming and all programming to include and mainstream inclusion in everywhere. Accessibility, which is, I would say, the most important issue. We can mention that, you know, ensuring persons with disabilities have access and equal paces with others. Uh, Mentioning something about Syria, uh, Syria situation, uh, I would say like there is an overall people with disabilities face significant challenges in enjoying an adequate standard of living and leading in independent lives in Syria. In Syria, we also, I can mention something about uh, um, the response on the disability uh, the protection sector has jointly with the Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor uh, conducted a joint uh, workshop which is mainly on enhancing the inclusion of people with disabilities in the programming for 2023. This was conducted jointly, as I said, with the Mosul, Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor. It was a successful step and we consider it in the protection sector as an achievement. And the main purpose was to align what both humanitarians and Mosul, uh, Ministry of Social Affairs, do on disability inclusion. It was a big workshop and even uh, attended by different experts from UN, NGOs and INGOs from inside Syria or outside of Syria. The outcome of this uh, workshop was successful and some partners even like us, the protection sector to carry on and proceed with such event and organizing such workshops, mainly on disabilities. And in conclusion of this workshop, the humanitarian responses of persons with disabilities present critical opportunities to build sustainable programs, activities, and services. Above all, uh, the protection sector jointly had uh, uh, conducted the training they brought uh, from human and inclusion trainer, Sabrine. She attended, she came to Syria, and we did the uh, training on disability inclusion and the, in the humanitarian response in all Syrian governorate. It was a very, very successful training. It was really requested by the protection partners. And we came up with the tens of recommendations, I would say, mainly like to agree how to unify approach of identification of persons with disabilities, uh, moving toward empowering people with disabilities, and uh, humanitarian actors just uh, also was a, a main highlight. Humanitarian act actors are mainly focusing on physical, on physical disability and less concern on MHPSS. It is highly recommended to draw the attention of humanitarian coordinate, uh, humanitarians to uh, the pressing need and support on the MHPSS. I would also mention that Help Age International has hired a national age inclusion specialist to support the inclusion. 
Finally, I would say the protection sector is seriously, in Syria, is seriously continues to advocate for disability inclusion and AGD in both HNOs, uh, HRPs, and even in POWs. And uh, incorporate the must do actions and include key indicators inclusion of partners with disabilities. The main high because several times like persons with disabilities should be involved always in decision making. They have to be consulted in programming, they have to always in protection mainstreaming to be always our uh, the way forward both protection mainstreaming and uh, giving the chance for and involving persons with disabilities in all programming i don't know if you have uh, some questions thank you amjad we will leave the questions later really interesting experience and uh, yeah i appreciate your effort in uh, in Syria to move and keep moving forward toward inclusion. Thank you so much uh, for you. our next panelist. Joel is a program coordinator in a humanitarian action a UN Women's Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific and Asia Pacific JHA Working Group co-chair. Uh, Joel. By understanding gender and diversity dynamics, responders can develop context-appropriate intervention, ensuring that diverse needs and vulnerabilities of women, men, LGBTQ individuals, and people from various backgrounds are effectively addressed in emergency situations. Some of the most recent cases from the Asia-Pacific region include the flooding in Pakistan, flooding in Myanmar, we know that the working group has promoted a rapid gender analysis based on different available tools to provide invaluable insight into the gender specific impact of a crisis. Enabling swift and targeted response that address the compounding needs and vulnerabilities of the most vulnerable uh, population. How have these tools been instrumental in understanding the unique needs, vulnerabilities, and capacities of gender, LGBTQ, and diverse individuals in crisis? Thank you so much for the question, Sabrine, and hello, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Joel Charbonneau. I'm the co-chair of the Asia-Pacific Gender and Humanitarian Action Working Group. Uh, we coordinate gender stakeholders across the region to make sure that the specific needs and vulnerabilities of women, girls, gender diverse individuals, men and boys are included both across the region and in in-country level humanitarian responses and advocacy efforts. So as we know, the first stage of any humanitarian response is to conduct a needs assessment and an analysis. And it's based on these assessments that decisions around funding allocations but also program design and areas for priority focus are made. And so therefore, it's really imperative that we make sure that any assessment has a strong focus uh, and inclusion of the specific needs and vulnerabilities in order to ensure that the most vulnerable groups within a community are receiving the support that they require. And in this case um, of different gender gender identities and where possible, making sure that um, women-led organizations or people um, of diverse gender organizations themselves are leading on these exercises uh, and analyses. So while response-wide humanitarian assessments are improving, by nature, they're often targeted at the household level and they often do not reach out to those who are most marginalized. So I'd like to share today three tools and some experiences within the Asia Pacific region that we've had using them that will hopefully help to inspire you. So the first tool that I would like to discuss is the one that I think everyone is gonna be the most familiar with. And this is CARE International's Rapid Gender Analysis Tool. So the CARE RGA tool is available online. It's very flexible, drawing on existing data and then quick primary data collection. And it has a range of different tools for that data collection from focus group discussions to key informant interviews, community mapping, uh, gender protection audits, and others. 
So most recently, the tool was adapted by the Giha community of practice during the Cyclone Mocha response in Myanmar. So I don't know if everyone is aware, Cyclone Mocha was one of the strongest cyclones ever recorded in the country, and it made landfall in May this year. It affected 7.9 million people across the country, um, but Rakhine State in the West was the worst affected, with around 1.2 million people impacted. Um, and many of those were internally displaced people who were living in IDP camps. And so the cyclone made a very dire situation uh, even worse for communities who are already living with the compounded crisis of COVID-19, ongoing conflict, and political and economic upheaval. And then there are some significant operational challenges in Myanmar, uh, including restrictions to humanitarian access. But following the cyclone, the RGA tool was adapted to be conducted through an observational review by local organizations. And so to highlight, um, for example, some of the protection concerns that were raised, these observation teams determined that toilets and showering uh, or bathing facilities were posing an obvious security risk in a number of areas, um, including through environmental issues such as open sewage, damaged and dangerous structures, and proximity to streams. And many of these sites that they observed, there was limited or no access to toilets, which was forcing people to practice open defecation. And in those locations where open defecation was practiced, observers noted that many of these areas were remote and unlit, and therefore very risky for women and girls, um, and completely inaccessible for older people and people living with disabilities. So I think that the Cyclone Mocha adaptation of the tool is a great example of how humanitarian responders can be very creative in making sure that analysis of gender issues is ensured. The second tool that I would like to highlight is the EDGE Effect and UN Women's Diverse SOGIESC Inclusion Rapid Assessment Tool. Uh, SOGIESC uh, stands for Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity and Expression, and Sex Characteristics, or we can for, refer to LGBTIQ+, which everyone may be more familiar with. So there is a massive lack of LGBTIQ perspectives in humanitarian assessments, um, and frankly, even in most gender analysis. So often we see in assessments a general commitment to meet the needs of other vulnerable groups, or we may see mention of LGBTIQ groups, um, communities in passing, but without really providing substantive guidance for how their inclusion uh, and needs can be met in the response planning and actions. So the diverse SOGS rapid assessment tool focuses on six key areas, program background, pre-emergency, pre-emergency marginalization and gender analysis, inclusion, participation and leadership, protection and safety, shelter and livelihoods. And the tool requires collaboration with a diverse SOGS CSO who would lead on conducting the survey research with LGBTIQ community members alongside the humanitarian uh, agency, which would assess its own programs. So the rapid assessment tool was piloted in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, uh, where I'm actually calling from. And that context remains a positive example of where the issues and perspectives of people with diverse SOGS were raised and included in response assessments. And that led to some small gains. So the Cox's Bazar response is notable for the inclusion of people with diverse genders, and in particular within the coordination process here. Uh, including the protection sector, as well as the Gender and Humanitarian Action Working Group. And beginning in 2022, a specific Gender Diverse Populations Working Group was started. So there are two CSOs, Bandu and Lighthouse Bangladesh, which are present in the protection sector, and also the Giha Working Group. And Bandu is the coordination coordinator of the Gender Diverse Working Group. And so Bandu has also been funded to provide health and psychosocial support services from a facility near the Kaputalong camps. Uh, and the UNHCR protection sector 
funding has also supported another facility uh, for TechNAF, which is in the south. Uh, while many challenges remain, particularly around widening the scope for addressing um, issues of people within the LGBTIQ community, beyond the Hijra community uh, and transgender women, the work in Cox's Bazaar on gender diverse inclusion um, is really a bright spot um, within a somewhat bleak picture. So the third and final tool that I'd like to share is UN Women's Rapid Assessment Survey, which was used during the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'd like to share this tool because the first are really focusing on kind of smaller scale qualitative analysis. Uh, and this one is for large scale, um, it's a statistical analysis tool. So as we all are very familiar with, during COVID traditional methods of data collection were disrupted. Um, however, that data was still crucial for us to understand the changing dynamics and the impacts of the in particular on vulnerable communities. And so UN Women carried out a rapid assessment survey through SMS, and they managed to reach over 17,000 respondents in seven countries across the Asia Pacific. And so the survey was followed up a couple years into the pandemic, this time using computer assisted telephone surveys to understand the short and medium term impacts of the COVID crisis on women. And the countries profiled um, were Indonesia, uh, Kiribati, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Samoa, and Tonga. And they were chosen because they're often countries with very little data collected, particularly on gender issues. Uh, the results of the survey had a number of important and statistically significant findings that the pandemic disproportionately pushed women out of jobs. Uh, and this was due to the increased burden of unpaid care work at home. That gender poverty gaps were exacerbated. Uh, and additionally, when they were analyzing the access to government support, disparities change depending on the country and context where some countries more women were accessing government support and in other countries more men were accessing government support. Um, UN Women is building on this work that they pioneered during the pandemic to look for other creative ways to fill gender data gaps during the crisis. So, for example, they're looking at using um, Quilt's AI tool, which pulls big data from social media platforms. This was also piloted in the Pacific Islands and uh, provided insights on the trends for seeking information about GBB service providers and showed what many of us here know, that service providers who use survivor center approaches in their social media had higher reach and engagement. So I think this final example is really important because it highlights that we need to consider not only qualitative methods for gender analysis, uh, but also quantitative assessments. Uh, data is really essential to inform our program programmatic responses, but it's also very helpful for our advocacy efforts. I think I'm at all the time I have for today, but I hope that provided some information on a few of the great tools that we have available to us to ensure that the most marginalized communities are not just included, but are at the center of any humanitarian response. I'll hand it back to Sabrine to continue our sessions. Uh, Thank, you so <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. It's really interesting, and um, I'm so excited myself to, to look to all the details. Uh, unfortunate that we have limited time, but let's see how we also compensate with sharing all of these findings. Our next panelist is Melissa. Uh, so we are moving to Afghanistan. Melissa is advisor uh, with CARE Afghanistan and co-chair of the Gender and Humanitarian Action Working Group. So Melissa, the, the new bans on women aid workers in Afghanistan came on top of the ongoing instability in the country, further depending on vulnerabilities of women and girls, including of women staff that are so critical to agencies. Why is gender response programming critical in context like Afghanistan? Can you share any learning that could be applicable and can be used with others? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sabrine, and, and thank you for the opportunity. And I'm, I'm very glad to talk after Joel so that I can also highlight um, kind of a concrete example of, of how we've been using these tools. 
Um, so hi everyone, my name is Melissa. So as, as Sabrina indicated, I, I currently work for CARE Afghanistan. I also co-chair the GIHA working group and I've been working on gender in Afghanistan for, for almost six years. And, and before I start, let me kind of set the scene in terms of what is the situation today in Afghanistan. Um, for a little bit over two years, since August 2021, we as humanitarian organization have been working under the new de facto regime in a context that became increasingly, increasingly difficult when it comes to gender responsive programming. So just to list a few, we have seen constraints on women ability to travel. Um, today, Afghan women are not allowed to travel if they're not accompanied by a mahram or a chaperone, a male guardian, which is usually their husband or their father, or in some cases, their son. We have been uh, strict gender segregation in the offices and the transportation. And we, of course, have seen uh, something that was largely covered by the media, which was the ban on women aid workers. Since December 2022, for NGOs and later on April for UN agencies, uh, there was a ban on women working uh, in the humanitarian sector, with the exception of the health and education sectors. So with all of these constraints, how could we as humanitarian community respond and how can we as the GIHA working group support our partners um, so to ensure that they have the necessary guidance and tools to do gender responsive programming. There are a, a large number of tools that I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later, but the main one and the most important one that I really want to highlight are the minimum standards on gender responsive programming. This came as a result of the visit of the Interagency Standing Committee to Afghanistan in January, so following the first ban on women aid workers in which we had discussion around you know how what should be the minimum standards that all organizations working in Afghanistan should respect um, to make sure that they continue reaching women and girls. So what we did as GIHA working group is we embarked on weeks and dozens of consultation in the country. We talked to national NGOs, international NGOs, UN agencies, to our gender colleagues, protection colleagues, field uh, officers to kind of map what are the risks when it comes to gender responsive programming, given the huge challenges that we are dealing with. We worked very closely, of course, with the other thematic working groups. So AAP, Accountability to Affected People, PSCA on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse and disability inclusion. So it was not just gender, it was also these other cross thematic areas. And together we developed these minimum standards uh, as a checklist so that organizations, when they are designing projects, implementing projects, can look at what are the steps and what are the kind of minimum standards that they have to follow. And what, how do we make sure that they are able to actually integrate it into their programming? Um, so, of course, these tools were translated in local language, languages. And, and, and then we, we started um, working on dissemination. Um, one of the important mechanisms that we implemented is, is strengthening our relationship with the cluster system and our partners. So, for example, today, each cluster in Afghanistan has a gender focal point, and they work very closely with the GIA as kind of like a core group. And it allows us to like kind of better translate the work we're doing for food security, for shelter, for protection, and make sure that uh, organizations are better equipped to use these minimum standards. Of course, so joint work or joint work with the AAP, PSE, and disability inclusion was was kind of a core also in making sure that organization um, are able to use these tools. Um, another key point in terms of dissemination is making sure we did not just present these tools at you know Kabul level in cluster meetings because we know that you know all of these meetings happen online; they're usually in English. 
Um, so there was really an effort to go to the regions as well, to travel to the east, to the north, to the south, and to do kind of like long workshop when we present, um, we get feedback, we answer the questions. And, and, and as in many countries, I'm sure there's always some type of disconnect between the capital and the region. So there was a lot of effort uh, in that sense. And then when it comes to the implementation, um, we also made sure that we do not just set minimum standards, but we also give the guidance that organization needs. Um, and that takes a few forms. I'll give you a few examples. We did research on HR practices, on the recruitment and retention of women ed workers. How do we make sure, we make sure that the advertisement recruitment processes are women friendly? How do we make sure the work workspace, sorry, is woman friendly. Um, we had advocacy messages for the de facto authorities that we developed along terrorist access groups so that organization know what statistics, what kind of, you know, like what are useful arguments that resonate with de facto authorities to get women colleagues to continue working. We had guidance on how to engage women of the communities in a way that is safe for them and safe for us and for the projects. Uh, we did studies on accountability to women and girls in terms of what are the best way that Afghan women and girls prefer to give feedback or to report complaints. Uh, we did paper on the mental health of women and workers in terms of how can we best support our women colleagues in this incredibly challenging environment. We also worked a lot on women-led organizations so that we can do advocacy on their behalf. Um, and maybe the last one that it's an ongoing work we're working on is a, is a twinning approach as well, which is how do how can we make sure that international and national organization can partner so that there's a true capacity building component and not just subcontracting national NGOs. One last point, I know I'm, I'm coming up to time. Uh, we were also able to work with a pool fund in Afghanistan. It's called the AHF, the Afghanistan Humanitarian Fund. Um, the GIHA and thematic group are involved in reviewing the proposal, but this year the endorsement of the thematic working group became mandatory. So we were actually able to review all proposal that went to the pool fund and work with the organization based on this minimum standards to ask okay, how are you going to make sure that you are actually assessing women and girls? How you make sure that your age mechanism or you know woman friendly how do you make sure you know like it's it, it was really really interesting for us to see you know where organization we're coming from and to really offer them this very concrete support for proposal for each project in terms of how can they improve their project designs um, so of course there's much more to do in current terms of monitoring and tracking and we can talk about that maybe it's a bit later um, and this was kind of a good example of, of how we managed to adapt in our in this extremely challenging environment, unfortunately, in a reactive manner as a reaction of, of these challenges. Uh, but I hope this is something that maybe can inspire other country contexts to look into how they can kind of better, better improve this type of, uh, of gender responsive programming minimums. So I'll stop here. I'm, I'm, I'll share my contact information as well in the chat if, any, if anyone wants to be in touch on that. Uh, and I'll also, also be happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Sabrina, and over to you. Thank you so much, Melissa. It's really interesting, great to have all of this uh, doable recommendation. And I'm sure that you will be reached by a lot of people to, to know more. Um, our next speaker is Anne. She's the Program Manager of Somali Livelihood Initiative and Disability Organization. So, Anne, uh, persons with disabilities are among the most vulnerable during crisis, facing increased risk and barriers to protection. Often in conflict and disaster, we see lack of uh, proactive measures tailored to the unique needs of persons with disabilities. Can you share any innovative approach and best practices that have demonstrated success uh, in ensuring the safety, dignity, and rights of persons with disabilities in South and Central Somalia. Yes, thank you so much, Sabrine. And thank you, Joel and Melissa, for setting the pace in this conversation. And hello to you all joining in today. I'm certainly honored to speak on this crucial topic. As you heard, my name is Anne, and I'm the program manager at we call it leadersome in short. Um, first, I'll start by shedding some light on the current context of 
persons with disabilities in Somalia at large. Uh, our data is very much limited, but it is estimated that the percentage of people with disabilities in Somalia is likely around 20% or more, which is higher than the global average of 16%. In some statistics, in fact, indicate that around 4% of Somali youth are living with disabilities. And these numbers tend to be higher among internally displaced persons and economic migrants. Um, one of the major causes of impairments in Somalia is the presence of landmines everywhere, and also what is known as explosive remnants of war, which they say results in roughly around 7,000 new disabilities every year, which is very high. And you may guess that children are very, especially vulnerable to this. So it is also crucial to highlight that due to the limited uh, data, there's limited awareness among policymakers, community leaders, and service providers. Uh, even though the current constitutions grants equal rights to persons with disabilities and prohibits discrimination, I'd say these provisions are often not eff effectively enforced. And there's also significant stigma around disability in Somali society and also Africa in at large, which often makes it a very a sensitive and a taboo topic. I can go on and on about the challenges, but despite the obstacles, uh, some remarkable progress has been made in Somalia. For instance, Somalia enacted the um, National Disability Agency Bill in 2018. Uh, the government also ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2019. And in 2021, uh, they launched the National Disability Agency. So I would say this is remarkable progress. So I'll proceed to answer your question on innovative approaches and best practices that have demonstrated success in our scope as an organization. Uh, our experience has taught us that having an inclusive disaster preparedness and response plan is key. You may be aware how prone to natural disaster this part of the world is, especially the Horn of Africa, particularly uh, disasters pertaining to droughts and floods and outbreaks of diseases such as cholera. And this are usually was worsened by man-made disasters brought about by conflicts, uh, ongoing conflicts within the country. So within our operations as an organization, we keep our risk assessment plan alive by reviewing it and updating it every quarter. And we do this in collaboration with the communities. Uh, and this informs our decision-making uh, processes during crisis. And it's important to highlight that the uh, input from persons with disabilities within the communities we target is uh, taken into account. Also, given our limited resources, we have adopted as a best practice training and working with community-based response focal points. These are volunteers who live within the community. Uh, they tend they keep records of persons with disabilities within their specific IDP camps. And during disasters, they tend to be the immediate responders who rally together in ensuring persons with disabilities are accounted for and kept safe. We have trained them to consider the mobility, communication and support needs of the persons with disabilities in the database. Uh, we've also been working very closely with community groups, that is women groups and youth groups, to create awareness and break the stigma of persons with disabilities. In most of Somalia and also various other parts of this continent, family members would rather keep their relative with a disability hidden away, which limits their participation in society. So through awareness creation within our target communities, we have seen an improvement in the participation and representation of persons with disabilities in these groups. Um, in fact, in these groups, they tend to air out what they need during humanitarian aid responses. And this ensures that their voices are heard. 
And because you also aim at building the capacities of uh, these people, persons with disabilities, as an organization, we have invested resources at a local training college known as Bismo College, where persons with disabilities in our program are helped to enroll. They acquire basic adult literacy skills, basic computer skills, which are tailored to their specific uh, needs. They also acquire carpentry, hairdressing, among other technical skills. And to, uh, to cement this, we are currently working towards creating a peer support network for these individuals in our college programs. It is a best practice we are borrowing from elsewhere and its implementation is still at its infancy stages. But the main aim of this is to ensure that they stay motivated to participate in societies, so even, even after acquiring these skills, so that they can break the stigma of disability. Uh, as an organization also, we have formed uh, referral networks with the health sector, which is key for assisting persons with disabilities to acquire specialized treatment or even counseling services. So every biannual, we do screening and referral and treatment where we can respond to a few uh, people. And this is driven by our in-house clinical officer. And as part of our food security and nutrition pillar, we have so far supported 5,000 households with food assistance to meet the nutrition needs of their children with disabilities. And every year during Eid, we host a celebration for these children with disabilities so we can share together in hope and also bring. Uh, lastly, it's important for me to mention that Lidosom takes part in Somalia's protection cluster, food security cluster, and health cluster. And in these clusters, we continue to raise awareness and advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities in Somalia. So lately, during these cluster meetings, we are advocating for capacity building for humanitarian workers and government personnel, since they are among the first responders during crisis and are also key stakeholders in policy development. Uh, we are also advocating for accessible infrastructures in common spaces such as schools and hospitals so that people with disabilities can access these spaces and also the inclusion of mobility equipment as part of the humanitarian response kitties. So to conclude, I need to emphasize that addressing the issues of persons with disabilities in Somalia requires the involvement of everyone from citizens to policymakers to key decision makers in government. This will not only enrich our data on disability, but also increase awareness, ensure effective policy enforcement and win support from both local and international actors so that we can make meaningful strides towards ensuring the safety, dignity, and rights of persons with disabilities in times of crisis. Thank you, and over to you, Sabrina. Thank you so much, and I equal your voice, and it's really important that it's responsibility for all of us, a great effort. Thank you so much. Let's go also now to, to listen to Grace. Grace is uh, the founder of the Inclusive Friends Association that's focused on data-driven organization that works to remove the barriers that limit the full participation of Nigerians with disabilities and also promote inclusive development around the world. What violence means to women with disabilities, how women and girls in Nigeria experience violence in a time of violent conflict and relative, uh, relative uh, peace, so is, uh, there is a growing recognition of the need or to protect and to promote the rights of women and people with disabilities, especially in time of insecurity and violent conflict. The violence of women and girls with disability experience during violent conflict form a continuum with their experience during time of uh, re uh, relative peace. They are more likely to experience gender-based violence, but less likely to speak up be believed and access services. You have been supporting them, Grace, and witnessing their realities in Central North Nigeria for many years. Can you share their voices with us today? Thank you, Grace. 
Hello, can you hear me? All right, perfect. Yes. I was trying to um, hear. Can you can you open yes your camera? Ah, welcome, Grace. Thank you so much, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon here in Nigeria. So I would like to um, take the perspective of sharing testimonies, um, mine and the voices of what girls and women with disabilities in Nigeria faced and are still facing in, um, in the face of conflict in Nigeria. So starting with my own story, I live in a community where um, it used to be a mixed community of um, different religion, dominantly the Muslim and the Christian um, Popular, um, religion. And one of the crises erupted. And just a minute, let me shut my door. A baby is crying. Just a minute. It's fine. All right. So I started by saying that I live in a community where it's mixed religion, both the Muslim and the Christian, and of course, other religion were uh, coexisting. And um, during one of the, the years that the crisis erupted, it, um, it became so violent and so wild that um, um, the, the, because it was predominantly populated by the, by the Christians, um, the, the Muslims suffered the attack more. And directly behind my house was owned by a Muslim. And um, while the crisis was ongoing, the it's on fire. But because we were in my own house and we didn't know which of the house was on fire and the smoke invaded my house, the, the, the whole house was filled with thick black smoke. We actually thought that it was our own house that was on fire and we had to run out. And before running out, the people from the house that was set on fire, the Muslim community scaled over the fence into our own house. And when they joined us, we were all hidden in my house when the smoke became so unbearable and we had to run into another neighbor's house. So for me as a woman with a disability, with a physical disability on a wheelchair, at first people started running out and didn't pay that much attention to me. Everyone was running for safety because we thought it was a house that was set on fire. And I think in the process of running, someone remembered that they had left Grace behind and they quickly came and wheeled me like I wasn't even ready. I didn't pick up anything, any of my needs, supplies. I was quickly wheeled out of the house into another neighbor's house. The house wasn't even accessible, but you know they managed to get me into that house just for safety's sake. So I, I wanted to say that um, when mechanisms used to warn communities of risk and danger that exist, I mean, they do not reach out to women and girls with disabilities. Like we didn't even know what was going to happen. And then I was caught up in that same experience. And we, we stayed in that house for hours. I didn't have any form of um, hygiene um, materials that I would need to care to, to just clean myself up. Eventually, the house wasn't accessible, but it was the quickest place for safety that we had to hide. And we all were stuffed in one small room for hours and hours until safety came and we were able to um, go back home. But I'm going to also share experiences of other women with disabilities from the study that we carried out in other communities within the same state. Um, so this is coming from a story of another woman. Her name is Aisha from one of the local government areas in Plateau State. She says that for her, she's a deaf woman and she sits in the room and she cannot hear what is happening because she is deaf. When fighting comes, everyone saves their life. So I'm quoting her exactly as she said it. She said, when fighting comes, everyone saves their life. She sits in the room and doesn't even know what is happening. So she's calling on their community to learn to love one another because when there is love in existence, uh, people with disabilities would be, would be reached out to in the face of any form of conflict. Another woman with disability who, um, who also shared her experience was that, um, that the community had received warning that a raid was about to take place. 
So the community members placed the people with disabilities and the elderly, uh, elderly in which in, in, in a room where they were all locked. You know how it is when people with disabilities and the elderly cannot flee or flee very fast. So the people of the community came together, brought the elderly and persons with disabilities, locked them in a, in a, in a safe room while they all escaped. And they did that not intentionally, but they did that hoping that it would save those people. But unfortunately, when those who were attacking came, they set that particular house on fire, that house that contained both the elderly and persons with disabilities. This is a story of one of the women who, 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 um, who she, she was affected indirectly or directly by um, the process of this fire. And I just want to say that this act was not deliberate. You know, it wasn't a deliberate, it was just a way of escape for the people of the community, but they thought it was safer to lock the old elderly persons and persons with disabilities in a room and thinking that they would be safe. But unfortunately, these people lost their life. So globally, um, women with disabilities are twice as likely to experience domestic violence and of course, other forms of gender-based violence. And up to three times more likely to experience rape by strangers or acquaintances than women without disabilities. I mean, those of you who work within the disability community, I know that you know this for a fact that during time of conflict, there's that this increase of rape, there is increase of kidnap and all of that. Another story I'm going to share is the story, I mean, that it, it, it that really touched me um, is that a visually impaired woman, she was cooking when everyone started, you know, um, shouting that um, the community is being raided, the community is being invaded. Of course, she couldn't get her kids, so she started running. She wasn't running with her white cane. She wasn't running with a guide. A visually impaired woman just running to whatever direction she felt was maybe safe. And there was nobody to help her. Instead, well, instead of her running towards safety, she ran into the hands of the enemy. You know, and she was raped in the process of that. And while she was being raped, she passed out. And, you know, the people, the, of course, the people who attacked thought she was dead and left her on the floor there where, where she was raped. And eventually when she woke up, she found herself in the hospital. And, I mean, subsequently in the course of um, while peace was being, being restored to the community, she discovered she was pregnant. While she was raped, she was pregnant. And of course, nothing could be done because she has become a, a victim of rape. And she shared her story till that point where we met with her. She says she still fidgets. She still gets very, very scared. And, you know, when she hears the voices of people. So in terms of trauma, she's still very, very much traumatized. Another story I would share is, is, what is uh, in one of those conflicts that happened in one of the LGS also was that um, when the headsmen attack. So what happens in that part of the north central Nigeria is that there's always farmer header attack and there's, there's religious attack as well. So this particular one is a farmer headers attack. And um, the woman mentioned that when we, they all ran um, to the farm for safety out of fear for being killed. And, you know, they were, were, weren't armed, but they were youths within the community who were protecting, but they were not well armed as well. So of course she was also raped and other numerous women who were there as well were raped. And this, I mean, the stories goes on and on and on. But just to say that even while we were conducting the research in that community, after we were done and left the community, the night of the day we went to conduct this research, that same night that community was attacked. We didn't get an early warning signal when we went into those community. And while we, we left, the community was attacked and two of the people that we engaged to get this information from, two of those people were killed. They were both deaf. And what happened to them was that they ran towards the danger because they didn't hear the gunshot, they didn't hear the alarm. So I'm going to conclude by saying that um, we as a national community and then of course international community, national community donors, agencies, even the US agency should I mean, you should come up with mechanisms that would, that would be inclusive. So 
my call is that we should stop stop framing mechanisms without preparing women with different types of impairment in mind. So this must change our girls and women with disabilities should shouldn't you know continue to suffer rape or continue to suffer harm because early warning mechanisms or every every other form of interventions are not designed to capture every type of disability. Thank you, Grace. It's very strong and touching uh, stories. Yeah, I hope that as after this session, I think it's important to to think a lot how we are responsible to to take actions toward being more inclusive. Thank you so much for sharing this. I think during the questions also we can hear more of recommendation that you would like to share. Let me go to uh, our uh, panelist, Rawan. Rawan is a global age inclusion specialist working with Help Aid. Uh, Rawan, uh, a growing body of evidence suggests that older people constitute significant and growing proportion of those affected by humanitarian crisis and disaster and are neglected by humanitarian protection assistance. Therefore, there is their needs and capacities are often overlooked in an emergency response, creating protection risks. How can humanitarian actors ensure that older people with and without disabilities are included in the response? Thank you. Thank you, Sabrine, for this uh, question. Thank you, colleagues, for your uh, valuable inputs on this uh, very important topic. As Sabrine mentioned, my name is Rawan Khouri, and I'm the Global Age Inclusion Specialist working with Help Age International and also supporting the Global Protection Cluster on uh, um, Age Inclusion. Thank you all for coming today and participating in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, first, uh, let us highlight that the uh, uh, global population is aging much faster than in the past. And, and this is the result of a continued decline in fertility and increased life uh, expectancy rates. Uh, the global projected proportion of the population that are aged 60 and above is expected to increase from around 13% to 22% by the year 2050. While population aging started in uh, high income countries, it is now low and middle income countries that are experiencing the greatest change. And by 2050, 80% of the world's population over the age of 60 will be living in low and middle income countries where disasters are more likely to occur and their effects are felt more severely. Um, an older person is defined by the United Nations as a person who is older. Uh, in many countries and uh, cultures and contexts, aging cannot be looked at as only a number, but rather needs to be understood in its complexity and its interaction with other dimensions such as gender and uh, diversity. Globally, 46% of those who are over the age of 60 have a disability. This suggests that disability increases with age. If we also look at the gender aspect, figures will also tell us that older women have higher rates of disability compared to older men. What does this tell us? This tells us that there is a need to use an intersectional approach throughout our work during emergencies and disaster, to understand people's experiences in forced displacement and how they are impacted differently. It is very important to recognize the intersection of age, gender and disability to help us think about the impact on the older person, the family and the community and the overall protection and inclusion of older uh, persons. Humanitarian actors are committed to provide assistance and protection solely based on need and without uh, discrimination. Yet older people are routinely excluded from humanitarian responses, despite being among the most vulnerable. 
Reasons for that revolve around barriers that prevent an older person from having full and equal access and participation in society. Let us discuss the, the, the different types of barriers uh, for a bit. For example, misconceptions of older age can sometimes fuel negative attitudes and discrimination, which may encourage some to think that older people are not a priority to help. These are considered attitudinal barriers, and they are the root cause of discrimination and exclusion. Another type is the physical or environmental barrier that includes the lack of accessible transportation and facilities, such as the presence of stairs or the absence of ramp. And this will prevent older people from accessing services. Moreover, if information on humanitarian services is provided in only one format or language, it can exclude many older people. And this is known as communication barriers. Finally, the absence of laws, policies, and regulations that prevent older persons from participating in society is what is known as institution barriers. To, to overcome the barriers that we have discussed and in order to promote the, uh, the inclusion of older persons in the humanitarian context, a set of standards were designed to help address the gap in understanding the needs, capacities, and rights of older people. The humanitarian inclusion standards for older people and people with disabilities provide guidance across all areas and at all stages of the response to ensure that older people are not left behind and to emphasize that people are at the center of the response, ensuring meaningful access, safety, and dignity. The guidance includes a lot of uh, nine uh, standards and sector-specific standards that can be used as guidance for programming and also as a resource for training and advocacy, particularly for influencing organizational policies and practice to be more inclusive. Now, all the sector-specific standards we have uh, discussed, they include key actions, uh, guidance notes, tools, uh, and resources, all structured around three main areas of inclusion, data and information management, on identifying and removing barriers, and third, participation of older persons and strengthening their capacities. Now, just quickly for a few minutes, let's try to apply those three key areas of inclusion to the protection sector. So looking at the first key area of inclusion, focusing on data and information management. Protection actors need to think about adapting protection assessments and monitoring tools to collect and analyze data that is disaggregated by sex, age, and disability, and also to try and collect information on the protection risks and capacities of older persons. For the second area of inclusion, which focuses on barriers, we need to ensure that older people are always protected from risks of physical and psychological harm and that they have access to protection services. This could be achieved through building awareness among staff, community, partners on the increased risks that are faced by older persons and on, as colleagues mentioned, strengthening case management and referral mechanisms to ensure that older people at risk are identified and, uh, and uh, uh, referred. And we always need to remember that we need to address and monitor the barriers that we have just previously discussed. And finally, for the third key area of inclusion, which focuses on participation, it, it focuses on older people participating in prevention and empowerment activities. And this could be achieved through using a range of communication channels and methods to ensure that older people have access to such information and such activities, and to always try and include older persons with and without disabilities in community-based protection activities. In conclusion, having such standards will play a very important role in strengthening accountability, 
and empowering agencies to reach all order persons. And as Sabrine mentioned, there is a growing body of evidence suggesting that older people constitute a significant proportion of those affected by humanitarian crisis. As, all, uh, as well, all of our colleagues mentioned, it is our responsibility again as human actors to ensure the protection and inclusion of older persons in prevention and responsive actions. Thank you very much and over to you, Sabri. Thank you so much, Rawan. I think it's really important to look to how attitude and perception really rooted and impacting the way that the humanitarian actors are building their response. It's very interesting for further discussions, maybe. Uh, we are opening now the floor for questions. Please uh, raise your hands to indicate your interest to ask uh, any question or you can use the chat. Uh, we have the first per, uh, hand raised, me. Sorry if I'm spelling the name uh, wrongly. Please just mute, uh, unmute yourself. I will unmute. Voilà. Oui, mais merci d'abord, merci. Je Thank you very much. Yes, uh, you're right, Amédazon. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to actually be here today, and I was really interested in the presentation. I just wanted to talk about a few uh, challenges linked to the approach that we've been talking about. I think when it comes to technology, particularly with regards to disabled individuals, this can really cause uh, a great level of challenge uh, within our own national context when it comes to trying to to really roll out our activities, uh, we found that technology can become a real barrier. Another issue I wanted to talk about uh, for us specifically, we find that there's a lack of resources specifically linked to adopting and uh, implementing a response that is sensible, so sensitive to people who are uh, in the older uh, age bracket. I think there is a bit of a lack of, of information. Um, I'd like to really thank our partners who've talked about this already. We are really looking to examine uh, some of the standards, some of the information that has been have been shared. And we hope that we're going to be able to actually try to bring in some of these elements uh, with regard to our community protection efforts. Um, we need to also, I think, work on sharing information because there can be real barriers here as well, as we've identified. I think it's important to look at disabled individuals' inclusion in uh, structures that we're actually working with for advocacy actions. Um, how can we actually make sure we share information to allow these individuals to be included? I think this is really important for our community. I just wanted to share these ideas today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really important, yeah, information and access. I don't know if one of the panelists would like to um, to say any remarks around this, the barrier of communication and sometimes really, sometimes communication creating a huge barrier and accessing information is one of the big uh, gaps that the humanitarian actors is sometimes missing. Um, some yeah, of the I can. One, please. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, me, for raising this point. And as we discussed, yes, communication has become a barrier, especially for older persons and persons with disabilities. And uh, um, technology has uh, been used recently to communicate certain messages during humanitarian crisis and disasters. And sometimes we need to think and keep in mind that we need a diverse uh, of communication channels to ensure, uh, as you mentioned, the inclusion of persons with disabilities and older persons. And I guess the, the, the only way we could ensure that is by asking persons with disabilities and asking older persons 
in different contexts, what's the most suitable way for us to communicate the message uh, to those people? Because some older persons and persons with disabilities live in rural areas, sometimes in hard to reach areas as well. And so uh, consulting with them is a key area to ensure their participation and to ensure that uh, the message is uh, well communicated. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. We have Betty. Please unmute yourself. Hello, merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est Betty. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I and uh, I'm in charge of protection and safeguarding in Goma in the Eastern Zone. And I wanted to just come back to the issue of gender, how we can actually involve women in particular in what we're doing. This issue of integration does raise quite a few challenges for us because in terms of our communities, we have a real social imbalance. And I think this means that when we go into our communities and we want to work with men and women, we find that there's a real gap when it comes to a 50-50 participation rate. So we, we try to attain this balance, but the context, the situation in the zones we're working within don't, doesn't allow us to do this. So there are lots of activities we're trying to actually organize for skill strengthening and participation. And we're coming up again and again against this problem of an imbalance. So this is just a reflection I wanted to share today. Uh, so I think in terms in terms of thinking of specific activities, there might be more work to be done in terms of really trying to bridge this gap. Uh, if we can't bridge this gap, I think we're always going to be fighting against uh, this, this kind of imbalance of participation. I also wanted to say something in terms of disabled individuals. I think this is also a key issue for us. We've already carried out various trainings. I've uh, gone, uh, gone through trainings myself with regard to this issue. We're trying to really work on this uh, inclusion and, and also making sure that we cover all sorts of different disabilities. Um, we often, I think, focus on motor um, difficulties. So we think about, for example, access, etc., in a physical sense, but we perhaps forget a little bit about um, individuals who might have more of a learning disability and access in that sense. I think there is a gap. Our speaker said. Um, so this is something I really found resonated with me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's really a very important point to, to be raised and to think uh, around. Melissa, do you like to give any recommendation about how to ensure targeting women while the context sometimes is preventing to achieve this prevalence of having 50-50% um, between women and men in such complex communities uh, or contexts? Thank you, Sabrina. I mean, this is a very tricky question in the sense like as you say, if I take the example of Afghanistan, it's so much easier in a way to reach uh, male beneficiaries. And for example, we've seen cases where even we are asked not to have women beneficiaries just because it's so complex or culturally, socially, it's not necessarily um, accepted for them to go on their own to a distribution if they don't have a, you know, a guardian um, to accompany them. Um, what we... Unfortunately, what we have been using mainly is, is you know, a percentage asking organization to dedicate a percentage of their projects of the aid they're going to deliver to women, especially to women headed households. Um, and the only thing we can do beyond that is just making sure that we offer them the guidance they need. Uh, to reach these women beneficiaries to which these women headed household, especially, for example, on how to engage women for the communities so that they can be involved in assessments or maybe relying on third parties, um, you know, like companies from the private sector to, to support assessments when women ed workers are not able to, to, to participate directly. So we've kind of have had to be as uh, flexible and creative as we, as we could. Uh, and I wish I had um, a better, a better answer, but it's kind of like, you know, it's, 
we've just had to work with the context. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Monica, please. Hello, everyone. This is Monica Rahal, WPE Women Protection and Empowerment Coordinator in Lebanon for uh, working at IRCC. So uh, just wanted to share with you some hey, key, uh, key points that IRC is working on inclusion and uh, ensuring the inclusive of people with disabilities in our program and uh, targeting more people with disabilities. Uh, first uh, point is like partnering with grassroots or organization where their mandate and their vision is uh, uh, working with people with disabilities. And uh, this uh, will be also so uh, with the contextualization of the tools and materials that has been used under IRC's uh, intervention, because not all the curriculum, uh, yeah, the tools and the activities cannot be uh, uh, done without being adapted to uh, their intervention and their uh, capacity. In addition, uh, as, uh, uh, selecting uh, strategic partners where it's uh, regardless of the funding requirement, those partners who are aiming to include people with disabilities will have the mission of building the capacity of other staff members and local partners staff on how to be inclusive. So uh, it will be in the mentality of the staff to ensure that we are inclusive in our approach as well. Uh, and uh, try our best to have like assessment on our safe spaces and our activities to be as uh, inclusive as we are. Just on one comment and specifically maybe uh, uh, reflecting this uh, specific webinar, it would be, it would be better if we be, we have um, an inclusive approach as well for us as partners and as organization implementing in the field, because we should be the one inclusive for our staff as well. We should be uh, advocating for people with disability to work in our uh, uh, organization, and that will allow them to have a space where they can be more vocal in their community. That those NGOs and those INGOs are more inclusive towards people with disabilities and other diversity and inclusion. So for that, it would be better to have like, for example, um, um, uh, sign language uh, part in this session so people with disability could access this webinar and to feel free that they are able to learn from such sessions as well. Thank you so much for having this opportunity. Thank you so much, Monica. It's really very important. Thank you for raising the accessibility. I think inclusion is the process that we all are taking. So this is, will be taken into account for sure and will be carried for the coming uh, forum. Uh, let me uh, ask Hakim, uh, please uh, unmute, please. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, this is me, Hakim, uh, from South Sudan. I work for Disabled Agency for Rehabilitation and Development. It is a national organization that is focused on the issues that are affecting fit uh, persons with disabilities, more especially in the humanitarian work and the conflict affected areas. That, uh, we are in in South Sudan. So uh, I'm very happy to be part of this important meeting today. Uh, and I've learned a lot in comparison to our situation. Uh, you have a yeah. Yes, hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also a person with disabilities and I'm working for this organization as executive director. Yeah. Uh, Based on, on my experience in South Sudan, uh, most of the humanitarian agencies are actually uh, on the ground and based on our uh, assessment on the inclusion, based on humanitarian service to affected areas, both affected by conflict and uh, natural disasters, we finally see find that most of the most uh, excluded 
victims of these uh, conflicts and uh, natural disasters like blood are children with disabilities, women with disabilities, which have actually suffered in silence because there are no even uh, areas where to for them to raise their concerns because they are just considered as as a people to be served but not to add their voice voices into planning and uh, implementation also of, of some of the humanitarian uh, services so with this our organization is only operating in one of the states uh, as South Sudan is, is comprised of 10 states. And uh, under this state, it has been in conflict for the last 12 years because there were a lot of uh, intercommunal conflicts and these national conflicts that has been actually turned the country apart. And as we speak, we have a good number of persons with disabilities who are underserved because based on the program designs, some of the programs are designed from far from the where these people are in, having forgotten some of the challenges that may even face them, more especially uh, accessibility to the to the to the distribution areas. This is where you can get even people with disabilities are not having access to the distribution sites because of the mobility aids to those places. And also some may not even have a proper information about where and when to go for distribution sites. And more especially those who are uh, visually and hearing impaired, including those with a physical disability who work on wheelchairs. So these people always suffered uh, in silence. And based on our organization, we have been actually making a lot of, of, of advocacy. Uh, whereas we also target the government and humanitarian organizations, where some of the humanitarian organizations who have an inclusive policies come out and respond, but there are some other agencies who have some of the emergency response that may even not... Uh, I allowed them to even reveal their plans. So with the say, you, 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 you get this population is actually underserved based on humanitarian services such as uh, education in emergencies, health, and also uh, more especially with, with, with the women with, with, with disabilities. They don't even access some uh, uh, hygiene and sanitation materials that are being distributed where distribution sites is not closer to them. Mm -hmm. We get these situations is actually affecting the most. And this forum is one of the best forums that we can even get an experience from other countries like uh, Somalia and Nigeria where uh, some of my colleagues uh, actually uh, narrated some of the stories that uh, has mm -hmm. touched my heart. And in comparative to situation that they are in, we have a lot of stories that if times would have been actually allowing us, we would have shared more stories about the, 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 the life of persons with disabilities. Otherwise, thank you, thank you for this time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure that there is uh, a lot to be uh, discussed. There is a lot of stories that can be discussed. 
uh, unfortunate. We have very limited time. Let me just call uh, Etop. Uh, I know that you are uh, facing issues to to raise your hand. So please, uh, you share that you have a contribution. But please, let's take maybe two minutes per question or remarks to be able to listen also to Sabah. Uh, yeah, please. Okay. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, I want to speak in French because uh, I want to give a response to my French colleague who have speaker before me uh, related to uh, community participation, uh, woman participation in person with disability. Thank you. Uh, cher collègue, je dear juste colleague, à... I just wanted to, to add a, an answer to the two concerns you talk about uh, for women and for women living with a disability on the basis of AGP. Dear French-speaking colleagues, every program, every project that you want to fulfill, the community must be in the center of this. If the community understands their role, they understand, they perceive their role, they will facilitate actions with all the members who are the most vulnerable in terms of accessibility, in terms of actions. And this is the basis for every project. You need to understand that every activity, it's not only a project, they are processes, they have phases. It will take weeks, it will take months. But you must identify the leaders, the people in charge, to whom you can get support in order to mobilize other people, especially women, uh, in regions where there's a lot of violence. If we do not have leaders, if we don't have people in charge, therefore, it will be difficult uh, to have added value, you know, and uh, the women will not feel uh, in trust. They will not be able to move about. This is the basis to get these elements. Same with budget. When the community is involved, we have a reduction of expenses in terms of expenses to travel. The community can help for travel, you know, and even for those who have uh, disabilities. Essentially, it's important to work with the community, with the community structures which are existing in order to facilitate all the interactions, all the activities that you have. It's very important. And please do not forget, for AGD, it's very, it's a process, it's a process. It is not going to happen overnight, you know. For AGP, you have obstacles and do not give up. It takes time in order to get to your outputs. And uh, I think that if you want us to exchange more with you, dear colleague, we can share that. But think about sustainability, think about the community structures which are existing. Overall, this is my sharing, you know, and I can share more in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, please. It's really valued inputs and feedback. Um, unfortunately, yeah, we are running the time to maybe I will take the last uh, question or remark from Samuel. And then we will listen to Sabah and then Amjad. Um, Samuel, Sam. Okay. So let me go maybe uh, to introduce you to Sabah. Sabah is a, a inclusion uh, ambassador in, in Syria. Uh, كيفك صباح شكرا كثير لانك حضرت معنا uh, حابين نسمع منك صباح ايش هي بالنسبه لك يعني الدمج ومن تجربتك الخاصه كامراه ذات اعاقه بسوريا ايش التوصيات اللي ممكن انت تعطيها للعاملين في القطاع الانساني Good day, everyone. Allow me to present myself quickly. My name is Sabah. I'm very happy to participate with you today in this meeting. So I come from Syria. I suffer from a, a mobility handicap. 
or disability in my lower limbs as a result of a medical mistake. I work as an ambassador for people with disability for the past three years in the organization called the Humanity and Integration under the ambassador program. I would like to talk more about uh, the suffering of women with disability and uh, what's their perception of the different difficulties they pay in their day-to-day -day life. As a woman with disability, I know much about uh, these difficulties. I would like to talk about the basic protection needs of women and girls with disability. In general terms, we can say that women and girls with disability are subject to violence in their day-to-day -day life by members of their families, perhaps by their relatives, their husbands, and they suffer from abuse by some individuals who are basically taking over and controlling their lives, leaving them no agency over their lives, over their education, over marriage, or even over having a, a life uh, that's simply free and independent. At the same time, there are other problems and difficulties that women and uh, girls with disability suffer from, specifically related to their reproductive uh, freedom and health. Many of them are forced to early marriages and uh, forced uh, uh, pregnancies, and uh, they are ultimately also deprived of their children as a result of this kind of uh, early marriage and uh, forced pregnancy. As a result, we do need to work more on uh, uh, promoting uh, the level of uh, community awareness in order to ensure that these women and girls with disability have uh, the possibility to enjoy their full rights and uh, to have uh, equal opportunities with other people. And uh, of course, uh, this is uh, what we always ask uh, active uh, humanitarian stakeholders uh, to work on to um, sensitize women and girls with disability about the need to uh, report cases of abuse and violence and to protect them once they report these cases. At the same time, it's important to enable these women with disability within their societies and communities to lead an independent life. And this can be enabled by providing them with the necessary work opportunities that are compatible with their types of disability because they also suffer from uh, the uh, risk of uh, poverty as a result of uh, the lack of job opportunities, low wages, and uh, the uh, increased living bills of people with disability. At the same time, it's important to enable women with disability by providing them with the adequate kind of employment and by providing them with the necessary facilities and the proper referral mechanisms in addition to promoting the level of accountability for women and girls that survivals of violence and to promote the kind of protection that they uh, um, are receiving. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for and uh, uh, Maybe we can ask Amjad. I see that you are raising your hand to have maybe the final words for our session and we just say thank you for everyone please amjad okay thank you thank you sabrina thank you for everybody i just need to highlight three points which is when we speak about the accessibility from protection perspective when we're here in the field or here and there we only hear about like physical disability uh, sorry about physical accessibility and we cannot hear about like accessibility to information and how to reach information and better communication this is number one. And then like when we install and put in place like monitoring and evaluation system content mechanism and feedback mechanism, it will be enhancing our work. And also I can add when there is a planning for HRP or any programming, not only to put up 
you know, this is like what I was thinking, not only to put in place like a, 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 tech, a, a text or a cell for a, a inclusion, a disability or what services, but only like, you know, uh, thinking about better, wider space for inclusion disability in the humanitarian action. I can only, I can also uh, said or mention something about uh, in some operation, not only people with disabilities, uh, with disabilities are forgotten or even uh, overlooked, but some in some other process they are stigmatized. They are shy to say that we have a disability here and there, and how they the community can even accept them, which is an uh, an important issue from protection perspective. The linkage between this and the awareness raising. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Amjad. I know that Al Ahmar. Uh, do you want to uh, to conclude or to say anything? Maybe one or two minutes before closing. I'm um, I'm so happy that all of you would like to to participate. This is giving us a lot of uh, go ahead with further and further uh, further sessions like this. Please. Hello. Um, thank you very much for these presentations. Very interesting. Very much appreciated. Salam alaikum. Um, I was also going to touch on what Amjad said. It's about the. Uh, it's not just about the physical. The the physical disabilities are not only mobility. It's also um, challenges with sight and hearing and the senses in general. I think that's really important. And we look at it um, in in our operation. At least we've been looking at it even in in the materials, in the IEC materials that we're putting out, how are we going to reach people who need Braille or people who are hard of hearing? These are all disabilities. There are the silent disabilities too. There's the invisible disabilities that people can't see, but there's the ones that we see and we don't actually appreciate that they are, uh, that they do need to be addressed. So it would be really good to see that we include the, the, the those who are uh, challenged with their sight, challenged with their hearing, challenged with other senses as well. I think that's really important. It was good to hear Amjad touch on that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think with these uh, messages, we can carry to think more and more how we can be more inclusive. I would like to thank you all. This is a great opportunity also to hear from your experience from the field. Thank you for the panelists uh, for joining us today. Uh, and we hope to see you again in another forum, uh, inshallah. And uh, have a nice evening to all. Take care. And